When should you get a transaction coordinator? I, I just say, get one of those. Like if you don't have one of those, get one, pay them whatever they charge per file. I mean, and I would say get one of those right away. All right, so here was the issue. The issue was all around getting administrative help, right? Um, especially in this upcoming market. Like we've talked about it, we know what's coming. A big tidal wave is coming in real estate, a tidal wave of change. More importantly, a tidal wave of a housing boom. We're gonna have, you know, we, we already seeing increased sales, set record sales volume this last year. The most sales volume we've had uh, in 10 years. And in all likelihood, everything is set up for even more this year, which means agents are about to get as busy as you can imagine. I know some of you aren't yet, it's March 15th, but don't worry, it's coming. April, May, June, July, August, we go from I need listings to I need a life. And that's what's gonna happen, right? So I wanna get ahead of that. I always try to get ahead of that because I don't like having these conversations in June when you're already bleeding out your eyeballs and you're like, I need to hire someone. And then it's, you just don't have time to even do a good job of hiring and training someone. So I kind of like to prepare for the need in advance. Um, so let's talk about the different ob you know, options for administrative support out there and for administrative leverage. Um, I know a lot, I mean, there's all different ways you can do this. Um, and I would love to hear some of you guys uh, at what you're doing to get leverage. Um, but first I kind of want to show you where that core leverage is typically used to help, right? And when I say core leverage, I mean, what the main thing that we need help with as real estate salespeople, as real estate agents and brokers, typically is we get so busy in the business. For some agents, all you have to do is get one or two under contract and you tell yourself you're busy as heck. It is what it is. If you're brand new and you haven't ever handled more than one or two pending at once, believe it or not, I get that you feel that way. There are some people that will chuckle and say, wow, wait till you handle 20 at once. But you know, there is some endurance here. Like you have to build that up. So I get it. You know what I mean? I do. I'm with you on that because you know, if you, you know, if you go out and try to run a mile for the first time, you're going to run it pretty slow if it's your first time. But if you do it every day, you're going to get fast track. So that does happen. So everybody's overwhelmed in their first transaction, even if it's the only one they have, because you don't know what to do, what not to do. So you tend to do everything and you tend to do everything slowly. And you tend to make a ton of mistakes that makes you do a lot of extra work and you get stressed out. And uh, so all of that happens. So when we do that kind of stuff over time, we get faster and faster. So different people need administrative support for different reasons at different times. So no making fun of people, no laughing at people, none of that stuff. But from a core perspective, at the very least, the reason people initially get administrative support is because they're too busy servicing the business to make time to go out and generate more business. So they get stuck in the customer service activities and get away from the income producing activities. And then of course they do that until the transaction closes and then it's crickets because they have no other clients because they stop trying to generate new ones. And then they panic. And then they oftentimes quit real estate. In fact, 33% of new agents quit real estate after their first year, and it's always for the reason I just said, they stopped lead generating or they never started. Make sense? 87% quit before their fifth year. I'm gonna say that again, 87% quit before their fifth year. And it's the same reason, they didn't make enough money. It's always the same reason everybody quits. And if the reason they didn't make enough money is because they stopped or never started lead generating because they always said they were too busy handling the business. So a way to hedge against that and make sure that that doesn't happen to you is to leverage that out to experienced help so that you take that excuse away from yourself. Because remember, this is crazy town up here and we're all the mayor of it. You know what I'm saying? So you start listening to this, boy, it can tell you a lot. So the core thing, the core activities that we typically need an admin to do is handle our transactions from contract to close, right? from contract to close. So let me just show you what that looks like at a high level. This might surprise you. Okay, I think you can all see this is my seller closing checklist. Before you all freak out, I'm gonna give this to you. So don't, you don't have to even put it in there. I may put the wrong file in there, then you will all correct me. That, in fact, there's probably a 50-50 chance of that happening. But this is a seller closing checklist. 
And you can see as we scroll down the seller closing checklist, we've got a lot of items on here that an administrative assistant or a transaction coordinator or some administrative staff member could take away from you. And there's quite a few things on here that depending how advanced this person is, that they could get on offense and do for you to generate more business, right? So initially, when you get a contract signed, offer and acceptance, we're gonna upload that signed contract forms and contact into the property file. We're gonna move in and we're gonna calendar all the key contract sales and deadlines, um, meaning like when all the inspection contingencies need to be removed, appraisal contingencies, closing dates, when the inspections are, all that stuff gets calendared, so we're way ahead of it. We're gonna email contracts, bid signatures all over the place, You know, call the seller at least once a week to update them, or if we're on the buyer side, call the buyer. We're gonna determine, ask all the key questions. We leave in utilities on or off, changing the MLS status, you know, put on a sale pending rider, collect the earnest money deposit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Don't worry, I'm not gonna read every single one of these. Um, but you can see now we're gonna start getting into, you know, getting disclosures filled out. We're gonna order home warranties on day two, or, you know, cause we gotta get those ordered right away. All the things we need to start getting out there. Um, we're gonna send a listing agent congratulation call to the seller where we ask for a referral. We always ask for referrals from our existing clients after we deliver good news. We just sold their house or at least got an offer that we accepted. So we're calling the seller to say, congratulations. We're gonna update our team scoreboard or our coaching scoreboard if we're holding each other accountable because now we've got one under contract, right? We're gonna probably order and obtain our neighborhood contact information so we can start mailing around it, calling around it, emailing around it so we can circle prospect around every listing. Notice a lot of you aren't doing all this. Why? Because you don't have freaking leverage. That's why. You're too busy. That's why people do this. That's why they're able to think, do things like create and distribute sale pending flyers, sale pending Facebook and social media posts, retarget Facebook ads around the neighborhood, you know, actually start circle prospecting, maybe even do some door knocking, that type of thing. This is typically for a team. You're going to get your agents out there prospecting around it now. Confirm the earnest money's deposit. How often do we forget that one, right? All of these different things all the way through. Um, and then we start jumping into like day seven. A lot of this happens the first day, you know, in the first three days. If you have leverage, it'll all get done in the first three days. If you're doing it yourself, it might take you a week, which all of a sudden makes deadlines harder to hit, creates a lot of stress down the road because you're ordering things way too late. And all of a sudden it's very tough on the deadlines and the whole transaction takes two or three times as long or two or three times more of your time to get done because of those tight deadlines, right? Uh, we're calling every single week with our seller with an update, what's been done in next steps. So the way we do that every week, we always call our active pending clients, whether it's seller side and buyer side, and we tell them the steps on the checklist that we did do so they love us and then we tell them all the steps that are coming up so they're reminded and they think we're thorough. And then we ask for referrals and we tell them we're gonna call them the same time, same day next week so they don't call us all the time, so they don't freak out and, and say that they're not getting any contact because they're worried about what's happening next because agents just don't do this. We don't proactively call our clients. We wait for them to call us. And if we do that, understand if you're waiting for, if your clients call you, you've got a customer service pro problem. I'll tell you right now, if your clients call you, when they're under contract, you've got a customer service pro problem. Because if you think of any product or service you've got, if you have to call them, you're mad. They should have handled that proactively. So please understand that. A lot of, it's just amazing how many agents think that they're doing a great job by answering their clients' phone calls. The, the problem is you sh they shouldn't even be calling you. They should know you call them every week at a set time so they're, they're at ease. They know their structure, that you're a professional. You wonder why the top agents get the most business. I think it's because of coaching like this. Anyway, moving on. Um, so as we keep scrolling down all the, all the way through here, um, again, when the property appraised, we call again and we ask for referrals because congratulations, you train your clients how to think. If you tell them to be happy, they will be happy. If you tell them to be happy, they will be happy. Okay. If I tell you to be happy, you're all freaking happy. It's the same thing that happens here. If you tell them congratulations, they're like, great. Just tell them, hey, an appraisal is a big deal in this market. It doesn't happen all the time. So congratulations. You can rest assured. We're going to get the value of your home now, right? Same deal. Congratulations after we get our inspections negotiated and request for repairs handled, right? So when, loan, when buyer's contingencies are removed, same thing. Congratulations. 
And then things get really heated up. Again, every week we're calling our client to update them what we've done and what we haven't done and to remind them of their key dates and deadlines, which I'm gonna tell you in a minute. Five days before closing, that's when stuff really heats up again, right? Five days before close, we got tons of tasks. And if you got two or three closing in the same week, a lot of you will freak out. But again, if we've got checklists and we're following them, we won't forget anything. We'll be on it. In fact, we'll get ahead. We'll be that driver in the transaction that's always asking for everything because we know that we've got to check off these boxes, right? Down the right-hand side, we check if we request it. And over here, we check if it's complete. And if every day we look at every file and look at every checklist, every file, every day, every file, every day, every file, every day. And if we look at every file every day and we scroll down here and we see blank marks, guess, that, guess what that means? It means I'm gonna badger someone. I'm gonna badger someone. Like someone needs to get me what I asked for. So I'm gonna send those CYA emails like, hey, just following up, have you got that yet? You know, and that now all of a sudden I'm way in front of them. People get impressed with me. They might get a little annoyed, but they're definitely going to be really impressed with me and they're going to respect me and they're going to think of me as a good agent that gets someone done, gets it done. So next time I write an offer, they're going to accept my offer because they know this guy's on it. Okay. And if you want that reputation, keep, you know, use a checklist or better yet, have an admin do it for you. Right. Day of closing, same thing. It's like the heat is on. We got all kinds of stuff here that we must do on the day of checklist or the day of closing, the day after closing, this is a lot of marketing guys. You know, we're delivering client gifts, we're sending thank yous, we're asking for reviews, we're asking for referrals, we're looking for to adopt the other buyer and this is the seller. So, you know, the buyer just sold our house. We've got all their contact information on the settlement statement. So we just start mailing them. And trust me, their, their agent will never stay in contact with their client after closing. That's one thing agents don't do. They take the money and run. So they don't keep that customer service going. So all you do is adopt their client by starting to mail them and email them as a part of your sphere of influence. And that's the adopted buyer program. It's very common. If you don't stay in touch with your clients after closing with 30, 60, 90 and anniversary date follow-ups, trust me, someone else is adopting your client. You wonder why they're not using you for repeat business. It's because you don't have coaching or this checklist, right? So we're doing that. You're gonna send a thank you letter to the co-op agent as well too, or the referring partner. We're gonna send out just sold calls to the neighborhood, just sold mailers, just sold Facebook retargeted ads and social media posts, right? All of those things are gonna happen. Then down at the bottom of our checklist, we have our key contract dates and deadlines, right? These should have been filled out day one because every time that my admin, or if you don't have one or your transaction coordinator or just you are reaching out to stay in touch with your clients every single week, you're gonna remind them each time of when your, discl when your disclosures are, need to be delivered when your inspection repair request needs to be in, when, your, when do the inspection contingencies need to be removed, when does the appraisal contingency, when you're moving, when we're gonna do final walkthroughs, all that kind of stuff, remind them so it doesn't surprise them and they'll have a wonderful customer service experience. I mean, the first time an agent's actually done this and it shouldn't be that shocking. Like if you don't do this stuff, isn't it, don't you feel guilty? Like it's crazy that you don't do this, right? Same with inspection information. Who are the inspectors? When is the date set? Have we got our report back yet? So we're staying on top of it. Again, these dates, we got to remind our clients, both buyer and seller side, including the other agent, when these dates are scheduled at what day and time, every single time, okay? And that is our seller's closing checklist. Now there's one for the buyers as well too. Our buyer's closing checklist is here. It's the same thing really. It's just the buyer side of, of all the work that needs to get done. Very similar, all the way up to five days before close then the day of closing, and then after closing, similar deal here, same contracts and deadlines, okay? So these are your closing checklists. I am gonna share these with you. That's the whole concept here. You know, that's the workflow. There's a lot that can be done if we get some leverage of some point, okay, of some type, okay? And it doesn't stop there. That's typically the stuff that a transaction coordinator will do for you. Typically there's one in your office and they just, that's just contract to close. And that's not just defense. There's a lot of offense in there, which means that's not just servicing the business. There's also some income, income producing activities in there. Getting reviews, asking for referrals, marketing around listings, circle prospecting. There's a lot in there that generates business for you that as solos agents, sometimes we just can't do because we're so busy handling all the rest of the checklist. But that's your TC, your transaction coordinator right now you see a lot of the big real estate teams out there go they actually hire their own administrative assistant or administrative manager why because they want a lot more than that done 
Okay, that's not enough for them. They actually want to get over to the listing side. And some transaction coordinators will charge you a la carte to handle your listings as well too. Okay, so listings, I'm going to show you as well. Is this boring? Are you guys cool? I can see you right now. Is this cool? Everybody good? Okay. We're Very talking about good. admin stuff. So I got to like take a pulse. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, this is administrative. You know, you never know. So there. Okay. Thank you. So now let's move over here to the listing side, right? Listing side's a little bit easier. That's why transaction coordinators that you pay for the file typically charge a little less because there's not so much stress involved. Like you're not dealing with like other agents, not getting you stuff and contingency deadlines. You're not, re you're not in, you're not relying on other people so much because when you rely on a lot of people from contract to close, people tend to screw up. Like appraisers don't show up, home inspectors don't do their part, the other agent doesn't do their part, your client doesn't do their part. Escrow officer, title officers don't do their part. I mean, there's all kinds of people that can screw up and cause stress. Now on the listing to contract side, it's really just task oriented, right? It's a lot easier. Um, you know, you got to worry about a photographer and a stager, but usually you have a pretty good relationship with them. And there's usually not this huge time constraint on them either. You know what I mean? So it's not nearly as stressful with deadlines and things. So it's a lot easier. It's very task oriented, right? Um, but notice right off the bat, this is how you impress somebody. You go take that listing and you're walking out to the car. You snap a photo of the house always. So you have some sort of coming soon marketing you can do. You always want to take a few photos with your phone. Don't ever wait for the photographer just in case you got like a pocket listing or you could list. Remember, we can also put them up inside the office private Facebook group and let everybody else know it's coming, right? Um, or if you've got buyers, you can try to double end it. They just, you know, most MLSs have some sort of rules about coming soon marketing to the public, right? And check with your broker. We talked about that. I'm not going to go in there again. I don't want to go into there again because we went in there about a month ago, pretty deep. And you get me talking about too many MLS rules, I'll get kind of cranky. So, um, but anyway, so, you know, the minute you walk out of that house, you have your admin call within five minutes and boy, is that impressed. Hey, this is Deborah. I'm with the Brian Eisenhower real estate team. And um, I hear you just finished up with Brian. Congratulations. So happy to have you on board. They're like, whoa, hey, I've got some stuff I need to take care of with you. I want to schedule a few things like your lockbox, your showing instructions. We're going to have the sign up here. When are good days for you to have the stager come out? I mean, you talk about being on the ball. That's what a listing side, a listing to contract administrative assistant can do. Now, you typically your office transaction coordinator is not going to do that. Someone that you pay for the file typically isn't going to do all this offensive work. They're not going to do the marketing. They're not going to do the wow factor stuff. Okay. Um, but you know, you also don't have to pay them a salary um, or, you know, you probably probably pay them less um, overall than you would paying someone by the file, but understand paying someone by the file. I mean, you know, it doesn't feel as stressful because you only pay people when you make money. If you're not making money, you don't have to pay them every two weeks, but depending on how much you sell, most people find it's a lot cheaper to pay someone every couple of weeks than it is by the file. If you're having a lot of success and you need leverage because it ends up getting pretty expensive that way too. If you look at the year, um, as a whole. Okay. Um, as we keep scrolling down here, you're going to start seeing all the tasks from listing to contract until the listing goes live on MLS. And then this is when it's very important. Not like this is going to happen in this housing market. We need to call them every single week to update them on our marketing activities. <laughs> like if you can even make it to the following Friday, you're doing great. So you probably don't have to worry about that too much. But when listings are sitting for a while, you're getting higher price points, luxury homes, boy, you better be calling them proactively every single week, showing them all their online views that they're getting, all the activities we're doing, telling them what we've done in the last week, what we're going to do going up, um, show the, showing them, you know, uh, market stats, any ML, any, anything that's gone pending or sold in their neighborhood. So we're sending them a new CMA every week so they can start seeing what houses are selling and what aren't. So that way, when they actually do reduce, um, they'll probably call you to reduce. But if you don't call them an update on them on market stats and online views, you're going to end up, they're never going to call you to reduce and you're going to have to sit and fight them for a price reduction just to let you know. So if you had price reductions, because you're not staying, you're not getting proactive. You're waiting for them to contact you again, which is really crappy customer service. Um, that's why you have to be proactive with your customer service. The, fa the fact that you answer their call and you care about their needs is just simply not enough, guys. Um, it's not enough to be good customer service, right? So we call them every single week and we tell them in the listing appointment, we're going to call them every single week and we're going to update them. So that way they don't freaking call you. That way they don't call you on a Friday night or a Saturday morning and disrupt your weekend. If they know you're calling, they have less likely to call you, right? So that's once the listing goes live, it's a lot of weekly updates with an email showing them all those charts I was just telling you about. Once the offer is received, of course, we negotiate that. And then we, and then uh, once accepted, we start our seller 
closing checklist, like I showed you from contract to close, okay? Now, one last thing I'm gonna throw in here. Again, this is never gonna happen with a transaction coordinator or someone you pay a la carte per file, but we also have a pre-listing checklist for those of you that get real active. This, this is the best. This is what you see that top agents have because the you know, top agents, they're going on listings every single day because they learned how to leverage a long time ago. They're not too busy servicing their business. All they're doing is lead generating. They're working on getting the business or they're at a point where they've developed such a clientele from lead generating so much, it just comes to them now. Either way though, they got here at some point, okay? So because of that, they're taking so many listings, they actually tell their administrative assistant, this type of person actually, they do pay, you know, on hourly or salary, they're on staff and they get them ready for every listing. I mean, they're doing CMAs for them. They're, you know, I mean, it's basically, you know, hey, Janet, I've got a listing at Thursday, get it ready for me. And on Wednesday, I need to pick everything up. So on Wednesday, I pick all this stuff up and I go and I'm just kind of reading it on the way there or maybe out in front of the house in my car. It's all done for me. I don't have to, I don't have to know anything about anything at that point. Okay. Cause I've got someone that's doing everything for me. They're doing CMAs. They're preparing all the, you know, all the things on this list that I need. Okay. So that's, what's done first, the pre-listing checklist. Once I take the listing, we jump from listing to contract. Once listing and contract, we get the house under contract. Then we go from contract to close checklist. So all three of these checklists are contain contained in the same worksheet. Um, there's actually four of them. There's pre-listing and listing to contract. And then we have contract to close for depending whether you have the seller or the buyer. Okay, and I'm, I, of course, I, I've given this to you guys before. For those of you just coming in, I'm gonna give it to you again so you can get an idea. You can totally edit this. It's a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, so you can edit it. You can actually take the whole thing, upload it into your CRM too. Um, I like to see things visually before I go CRM. Um, you'll see most teams go CRM. I mean, don't go CRM, they go with a checklist um, because you can see it, you can visualize working down that checklist every file every day, as opposed to getting notifications all the time. If you've got 20 pending and you're just getting notifications all over the place, you can't, it's very hard for you to go back and see what's incomplete and to see the flow of the transaction, like where we're at and what comes next, as opposed to a bunch of random notifications. Um, so that's why I prefer it this way. I know it makes me look old school. Trust me, I'm not old school, at least in this sense, um, maybe in fashion, but not in, uh, not in real estate um, agent management. So that's the idea there. Wow. Okay. That's a bunch. So with all of that being said, thoughts, questions, concerns, while I am uploading this differences between transaction coordinators, administrative assistants, things like that, questions about it, how to hire them, how to train it, pros and cons from each, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the sky's the limit on this, on this topic. I have a couple questions. Nice. Who is um, it? I can't tell where you're at. Nelson. Oh, hey there. How, how did I see? Okay. Hi. Right. Um, so my first question is, is when do you think that we should be hiring somebody in that? I'm just getting back into real estate. And so I have a few transactions on my plate. I just closed one um, and I have a few coming up. And so what, what is your suggestion for that? Well, I think it's a, that's a heck of a question. It does differ from person to person. Okay, as a general rule, I think you have to hire a full-time person if you're doing 30 or 40 transactions a year. Okay, that's, that's when you have to. You're not gonna go past that very easy. I mean, you're gonna give something up. You know what I mean? Like a spouse or a hobby or your health. You're certainly not gonna be able to lead generate anymore because unfortunately, real estate's seasonal, man. I mean, spring and summer is when you're gonna get the bulk of those 40. You know, like 25 of them are gonna close in, in, four, in, in the four month harvest season of the spring and summer. You're not gonna be lead generating during that time. So that, that's, that's the general rule, Felicia. That's when you have to. Like at that point, you're just gonna hit a ceiling and you're gonna start bumping your head up against it and there's just no way to go, especially during spring and summer. You're just, cause all that, those deals are gonna come. And then what's gonna happen is winter is gonna be awful cause you don't have as much business and you're gonna try to lead generate the toughest time to lead generate of the year. It's when no one really wants to do anything, you know? So you end up just going in this roller coaster of busy, not busy, busy, not busy. And it's the up and down of real, of real estate, you know? So that's what makes it kind of tough. So that's why, you know, I say I hire in advance the need when you see that coming. Um, the next thing that I'll say is when should you get a transaction coordinator? 
like, you know, someone you pay per file. Does everybody, does, I mean, most of you have those floating around your offices, either the office provides one for you or they have someone they work with, or, you know, they're just, they're like journeymen. They're just kind of floating around. They're good to have around though, man. They're really good to have around because I think you should all get one right now. That's what I think. Cause I mean, I, I just say, get one of those. Like if you don't have one of those, get one, pay them whatever they charge per file. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the going rates are these days. I'll probably show my age, but you know, it's usually somewhere between 300 to 500 from contract to close side. And then for the other side, maybe, it, you know, from listing to contract, it's, I don't know, 200 to 400, I'm guessing those types of things. And that's your transaction coordinator. There's usually those floating around and they know your local MLS because they work with a few other agents. Um, and I would say get one of those right away. Marissa just asked, where do we find a virtual assistant? Um, number one, the answer is Google real estate virtual assistants, and you're going to find a ton of them. You can find real cheap ones at myoutdesk.com. Partner with them for years, but you got to hire those and you got to train those. Anybody have some other, you know, any other companies they want to write in there? I could look some up, but there's tons of them out there, man. There's tons of them. Uh, they save you time and you only pay for them when you close. And yes, it does come out of your commission, so you don't make as much. But as long as you use your time well, you should free up your time to earn a ton more business to cover that cost. That's for darn sure. So that's why I think I get, I, I mean, I'm a big believer in leverage. But my, I'll put out there, uh, I'll search a little bit here. Uh, I'll think of some, some more. I would say my out desk is the most popular and they're very, very cheap. But the problem with them is you got to train them. Typically. There we go. Jody threw some in there. There's one right there. My VA team, my virtual assistant team. There's a direct phone number. I trust Jody immensely on that. I'd probably go with that before. I use wow. Ava's assistants and, and they're amazing. There you go. I like it when someone works with them. There's so some, somebody's got one man share. That's the whole point of this, you know, help each other out. Don't like hoard them. Like, oh my gosh, they're going to be competitors. Come from abundance, not scarcity. Throw it out there if you got one. So throw those out there. Um, let me see if I can find another one. A lot of my clients use. This is not like my wheelhouse by any, any means. I forget this stuff like you wouldn't believe. Oh, there is a company out there called, if you guys don't know it, I'm curious if anybody does know it. It's called upwork.com. It is my favorite thing. It's my whole coaching company's favorite thing in the world. And uh, it's like a combination between LinkedIn and Fiverr. So it's like an upscale Fiverr and Fiverr is kind of sketchy. You know, you, you hire people for gig work, right? But Upwork is like professional Fiverr. It's where you find graphic designers. You know, it's where you find computer engineers. You can find anything you need on there to do gig work, which is, hey, I need this one job done. And then you can interview them. You can even behaviorally assess them. Um, you can, it's legendary, man. This thing's been going on for like five or six years. Upwork has created the term gig work as a result. Um, and it is, we use them left and right. I, I, in fact, we probably employ full time 10 people that we found as an independent contractor on Upwork that we just kind of use so much, we made them our own. And now we, we, we uh, W2 salary them. Um, but you can find anybody do just about anything there. And if you go there and you, and you say, hey, looking for a ver experienced real estate virtual assistant, you'll get a ton of them. I totally agree with Bob, man. Start on Google. Nowadays, there's tons of them. Or go with like someone, someone says. But there's lots of options here. I, you know, I like it when someone is familiar with your local MLS. I do like that. Because every MLS is different um, and you have different forms. You know, so if they haven't worked in your state, you know, that, there's a lot of training that goes into it if they haven't done that. So that's the neat thing about hiring someone like this. That hopefully they already know how to operate with your MLS because they're going to be inputting listings and, you know, you know, doing things for you, hopefully doing CMAs, 
I always like to train people. I know that's hard to imagine having someone else do your CMA, but you know, it's real simple. All you do is say, hey, I've got a listing appointment this Friday. Can you take your first stab at a CMA for me and have it to me by Wednesday? Then they do a look, then they do it. You look at it, you edit it, and then make your own, which you were gonna do anyway, send it back to them, and then you try it again next time. And you keep doing this every single time until you don't have to edit their CMAs anymore. And you don't waste an ounce of extra time. And that's how you train someone to do a CMA. And if you don't think you can train someone to do a CMA, because only you can do CMAs right yourself, think about it. Someone trained you to do one. So I'm pretty sure it's possible. Everyone here think, got trained, right? Especially the people in your office that sell more than you. I bet you they wouldn't trust you to do a CMA. So there's all of that. Make sense? So I like it. Thoughts, questions, what else? What else we got here? We good? In a hey, Des? Can a group, like maybe a group within the office, hire one person to do all their stuff? Or does it always just one-to-one? -one? No, that, that, that happens. That's a great question. That happens all the time where, you know, you, it actually just happens organically where one agent gets one and then that transaction coordinator needs more work. Cause they, I mean, they can handle like 25 pending at once. You know what I'm saying? A real good experience one can handle 40 pending at once. Not joking. Transaction so coordinators though, but what about the um, the pre like pre-listing coordinator? Or oh yeah, so you get a little bit more extended coverage by mm -hmm. just two or three of you. Um, I think you can certainly do that as so long as you're all comfortable with the with them and and you guys are all you know. I, yeah, absolutely. It, it's definitely the next step to the one-on-one, -on -one, and it's definitely better than having a journeyman TC. So it could certainly work. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Good idea. I've seen that done too. Thank you. Seen, seen that done too. You bet. All right, guys, so very great job. Thank you for your patience today. Thank you for all the questions early on as well too. Hopefully those tools help you a little bit. Stick with it. Think about leverage because it's gonna be time to go this year, I promise, if it's not time already, okay? So big year, thank you guys.